Go ahead and have a seat. It's good to be with you today. Uh, you can open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 5. It's where we're going to be at today as we continue our look at the Beatitudes, the, the statements of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount here. And uh, I just want to take a, a quick moment as uh, a little aside um, uh, on the topic of gratitude. I think that, that far too many of us are uh, express t- too little gratitude for where we live, and not just the city that we live in, uh, if you're watching online, wherever you're at, but just the fact that we have a home, uh, a roof over our head, uh, shelter for that. Um, and to that end, uh, I-, I share this because I'm gonna be leading a mission trip in uh, the late April that I wanna invite you guys to. Um, I uh, just saw a need a couple years ago when I was in Mexico. Uh, So many people there live in homes made of pallets and cardboard and tarps and uh, makeshift homes. And so we're partnering with a ministry down there called Baja Bound uh, Ministries that identifies uh, using local churches and ministries, identify families who are in need of a home. And in a weekend, we go and build a 16 by 20 home for them. And so uh, I'm gonna be leading that trip. It's April 21st, it's a weekend. So if you're working, it's uh, a little easier for you to make that happen. Uh, And if you're interested in going, the information's on the website or you can reach out to me via email. Also, if you're interested in supporting that, it costs about $11,000 total uh, for a home, which is kind of hilarious uh, in our uh, kind of uh, mindset, but uh, that's the cost for materials to make that happen. Uh, And so if you'd like to go, I'll be leading that trip April 21st through 23rd, uh, and uh, you are invited. Uh, But we're continuing our look at uh, the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus Jesus shares the keys to a good life and and keys to a life full of blessings. And so we're going to get to that. But before I get there, I've got a question for you. And that is, what do you want to eat? And uh, that's such a tricky question. And anyone like me just completely frees up. You could be hungry. And as soon as someone says, what do you want to eat? You just go blank. Is anyone like, no, that's just a me problem. Okay, we can work that. But that's such a terrible question. The only question for me that's worse is, what do you want to eat this week? When my wife is like putting together the shopping list. And I not only have to think about what I'm eating for dinner today, but like what dinner is going to be on Thursday of this week. And I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen on Thursday. I don't know if I'm going to want tacos or like like meat, I don't know what I'm gonna want. And it's so paralyzing, but food is so central to everything that we do. And and as much as we kid about that, I guarantee there's someone in this room that was talking about where you're going to get food after this uh, concludes and what you're gonna be doing. There might even be some of you that were talking about what you're going to eat for dinner next Sunday uh, for Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, And so you are planning a week out and thinking ahead on that as, as we're preparing for that moment. But it's so central to everything we do. If something good happens, we celebrate and we eat food. If something bad happens, we get together and grieve and eat food. If we want to get to know someone, we go and eat food with them. If we're happy, we eat food to celebrate. If we're sad, we eat food to console ourselves. It's so central to our lives, and it's not just an American overeating problem. This has been the way it's been since the beginning of time, I think, because food is not only... uh, important for our survival, but it's part of just how we do our social life. And for Jesus, it was no different. His life was full of significant moments that had to do with moments surrounding food. As you look throughout his ministry, it seems this this pattern emerges. His very first miracle occurs, uh, and really the the starting point of his ministry here on earth starts at a wedding reception where they're, they're eating and celebrating and rejoicing in a marriage, and they run out of wine. And Jesus' mother comes and says, hey, this is what's going on. Can you do something? And Jesus turns water into wine and provides that for the people. And some of you maybe like that miracle more than others, uh, but that's uh, for you and God to work through. But throughout his ministry, we see this. There's significant teaching moments that happen as he's sitting around a table and eating with people. Some of the the most controversial moments come because of who he chose to eat with and who he gathered around himself. There's other miraculous events, at least two times that are recorded in scripture. Jesus takes a small amount of food and and multiplies it to feed thousands of people. In one of those instances, he takes it uh, as an opportunity to teach his disciples afterwards. In John 6, we see that, that Jesus performs this miracle. He feeds thousands of people and pulls his disciples aside and says, I am the bread of life. To signify, hey, as important as food and bread is for our survival, Jesus is even more significant for us. 
And I share this because as we look at Jesus talking about the keys to a good life, there should be no surprise to us that somewhere in the midst of this, we see food come up. That somewhere there's a pivot to talk about the food that that we eat and how this intersects our life. But let's, let's kind of catch back up to where we are. So the, the keys to the good life here, the Beatitudes, Jesus starts his sermon here in Matthew 5. The first one is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And then we get to ours in Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. As we look at this, I think there's several important things that Jesus wants us to see and process about our life. And the first thing that we need to understand is that appetite is a sign of life. See, physically, this is the reality for us. As you look even at, at little children when they're born, um, the, the, their appetite and their food consumption is an indicator of their health, and this continues throughout their life. So when babies are born, they're monitoring how much are you eating, how much weight are you gaining, how much are you growing, and especially in those first few weeks and months, it's something they're keeping track of because we understand that, that a healthy appetite indicates a healthy system. For us as adults, when we get sick, we often lose our appetite and we know we're getting better when we actually want to eat food again. Now, depending on what kind of illness it was, we may not want to eat the same kind of food again, um, but we want to eat again, and it's a sign that we're getting healthy. And unfortunately, when end of life is approaching for individuals, a, a loss of appetite, a, a choice to stop eating, especially drinking, is typically a sign that the end is near because that's the, an indicator of health. And spiritually, it's the same thing for us. What Jesus has shown us here is that a healthy spiritual appetite is a sign of health. So a question for you today, and that is, are you craving the things of God? Are you craving time with God? Are you craving his word? Are you craving worship? Are you craving that, that time to, to experience spiritual growth? Because if you have that appetite, it's a sign that you're in a healthy spiritual place. But I want us to kind of probably all acknowledge that our desire would be to have a stronger appetite for the things of God. We may want a, a smaller physical appetite uh, for certain food, but spiritually, I think all of us would say, hey, how do I crave this more? How do I crave God and his work in my life more? And so I wanna share just a few things that, that might be barriers to a healthy spiritual appetite. And the first is foundational, and that is a, a lacking relationship with Jesus. See, foundationally here, if we don't have a relationship with Jesus, if we haven't stepped into that life-changing experience of following Jesus for us personally, none of this works or makes sense. And it's so easy for us to think, oh, well, if I just do the right things, if I go to church, if I try harder, if I really seek to be a good person and go through all the right motions, then I'll experience the good life. And unfortunately, when we do that, when we think that our actions are what get us there, we find ourselves burnt out and disappointed and dissatisfied, and we don't actually get to where we want. Because it's only Jesus that satisfies. So it starts with a question of, have I decided to follow Jesus with my life? Have you recognized that you're a sinner in need of salvation and grace? Have you proclaimed Jesus as being the perfect son of God who came to sacrifice for you and said, Jesus, I wanna follow you with my life? Because that's the foundation for this. If you're like, man, I don't really crave any of this spiritual stuff at all, go back to that point and have you decided to follow Jesus and made that commitment? Now, if you have, there's still some barriers that get in the way. One of those is just being busy. Sometimes we, we flood our life with so much activity, so much stuff, so many things to think about that we never actually pause to hunger and thirst after God and his righteousness. And physically that happens for us. We've, we've probably all had those days where the day just is not what we planned. We were busy and things were, were going nonstop and we realized, man, it's four or five o'clock and I'm starving oh, I didn't eat lunch, or even worse, if it's a really bad day, it's like seven, eight o'clock at night, and you realize you didn't eat lunch or dinner, and maybe you grabbed like a granola bar for breakfast, and you're like, I'm going to eat like my steering wheel in the car, I'm so hungry. <laughs> and we've been there physically, 
but maybe some of us are there spiritually today as well, where we're just going nonstop. We're, we're adding more and more to our plate, more responsibilities, more worries, more stresses, more things to do that we don't slow down and experience God. We don't slow down, and as Psalm 34, 8 reminds us, we never stop to taste and see that the Lord is good. And if we're never seeing that God is good and recognizing that, we're not going to crave it because we don't crave the things that we don't know and understand and see as good. So are you slowing down? Are you taking a Sabbath and saying, hey, I'm going to take a day off and rest. Am I, am I gonna stop and set aside the noise and distractions of the world and just experience what God wants me to hear? So some, some obstacles to our spiritual appetite are not having a relationship with Jesus, being too busy, but another one is just consuming the wrong things. See, if you've ever been on a diet or tried to get healthy, you know that it's really hard to eat the right things when you're also eating junk food. And, and, and when you make that choice to say, hey, I'm gonna cut back on the junk food, it, it somehow makes it easier to eat the healthy things. And in turn, the more you eat the healthy things, the, the less desirable the junk food is for our life. Which gets us to the second thing that we need to see from the statement of Jesus, and that is that we need the right food. Now, I don't mean the right food for a meal today after service or the right food for our Super Bowl party next week, but we need the right spiritual food in our life. Because Jesus doesn't say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they shall be satisfied. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The direction and aim of our craving is what leads to the satisfaction that we want. So what is righteousness? Because he says, hey, if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we will be satisfied. So we have to understand, what is righteousness? Well, at its, its most basic definition, righteousness is right living, right or correct living. But we have to understand, how do we define right? And, and biblically, right is not defined on my opinion or your opinion. It's not defined on our, by our culture or what our friends think or what the, the internet or the talking heads in our world say. It's defined on what God's word says. And so us living a right and correct life is defined on us being obedient and submissive to the instructions of scripture. But here's the, the hang up. We, we all have sin in our life. We all are born with a sin tendency that makes it impossible for us to live perfectly righteous. In fact, the book of Romans says there is no one righteous, not even one. So if we ever think for a moment that we can just try harder and be better and attain that righteousness, we go back to Romans and say there's no one that can do that here on earth, which is why we need Jesus because he is the way that we achieve righteousness in our life. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that God made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him, that is Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. And this verse just shows us the incredible truth that Jesus was this perfect, sinless son of God, but yet he took the punishment that we deserve. There's a, a great exchange that happens here. He gives us his perfect righteousness and we give him our sin and rebellion and shame and regrets and mistakes. And so when we make that decision to be in Christ, as it says here, we get his righteousness. God doesn't look at us in that, that moment and go, man, what a screw up. They, look at their sin, look at their mistakes, look at their flaws, look at their issues. He looks at us and sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus. And there's, this is this generous and extravagant gift of God. But we need to remember that it is a gift. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says that, that it's by grace you've been saved through faith. It, this is not of our own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. We can't be like, God, look at all that I've done for you. Look at all the ways that I've earned this. It's only through Jesus giving it to us. And so uh, the, the direction, the aim, the, the destination of our hunger and thirst is his righteousness, saying, Jesus, I want to live more like you. You've set this perfect example. You've set a model for how I'm to live my life. I want to be more like you in every way. 
And prayerfully, the longer we follow Jesus, the more God refines and shapes and molds us to look and act and speak and conduct our lives like his son, Jesus. But along the way, we might be tempted to go off course a little bit with what I want to call spiritual junk food. See, if we, we want to hunger and thirst for righteousness, it's, it's as if we're on a, a diet plan and we're to hunger and thirst for the right things, but there's these temptations that come our way. And, and we're never going to get where we want to be if we're eating junk food physically, and the same is true spiritually. But there's some big categories, and I don't know exactly what you're wrestling with today in your spiritual junk food but there's things that get in the way of us craving righteousness in our life. And one of those is just intentional sin. You know that, that some area of your life is incorrect. You know that it's wrong, that God's word is instructing you elsewhere, but you just don't wanna change. You know that, that you need to confront that addiction, but you don't want to. You know that how you're living relationally or sexually is not what God has said, but you don't want to change. You know that how you're doing your business or conducting your life is sinful and dishonest, but you don't want to change. You know that you're not living the way God's instructed, but you keep doing it. And see, the, every time we walk in that, we limit our ability to hunger and thirst for righteousness because we're living in spiritual junk food. We're choosing a temporary, immediate satisfaction, and we're shortchanging a long-term satisfaction. And so the first big hindrance is that, that unrepentant, intentional sin. But the second is just simply living for ourself. And it, it just like a junk food, it feels good in the moment to say, this is what I wanna do, this is my priority, this is my desire, I'm gonna do this. But God calls us to a life of others first and him first rather than us first. And just like junk food, it keeps us from experiencing what we want. When we live for ourselves, our marriages suffer because we're not putting the needs of our, our spouse first. Our, our careers and, and business ambitions even suffer because our, we succeed by putting other people first and helping them win. Our friendships suffer because who wants to be friends with someone who's selfish? And ultimately, our, our spiritual walk suffers as we live this us first mentality because God calls us to submit all of ourselves to him. So maybe it's intentional sin, maybe it's living for ourselves. maybe it's just distracting or numbing ourselves. Our culture right now is in a place that is almost afraid of boredom and stillness. And so we, we go through our life and maybe it's not busyness, but maybe whenever life slows down, we just distract ourselves with TV or Netflix or endless scrolling until it's time to go to bed on social media. Maybe it's just constantly having noise on. We see through scripture that oftentimes God speaks to us in a small, still voice. And if we're always distracted, always numbing ourselves, we never get the chance to hear what he wants us to. So what's keeping you from hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Is there spiritual junk food in your life that needs to be confronted, that needs to be repented of, that needs to be turned away from? Because God wants us to live the good life. And as we build a healthy spiritual appetite, as we seek after righteousness, we finally see that God's the one who satisfies us. God is the one who satisfies us. And isn't that what we all want? We, we want satisfaction, and the promise there is that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. And that's what we all want. We get excited when we're shopping, and we see on a product, satisfaction guaranteed, and it gives us a guarantee that we're gonna be satisfied with that purchase. And maybe we're so excited about that because we know how hard satisfaction actually is to come by. But we all want it. We want satisfaction in our marriage or our singleness. We want it in our career, in our financial situation, in our physical health or appearance. We want it in all areas of our life, and yet we're constantly facing disappointment and dissatisfaction. And maybe it's because we're chasing all of those things. We're chasing relational satisfaction. We're chasing financial satisfaction. We're chasing physical satisfaction and the satisfaction of all the temporary things of this world instead of pursuing God and his righteousness. 
And Jesus speaks this. I want to encourage you to flip over with me to Matthew 6. Jesus is still teaching the Sermon on the Mount here, and he's starting to kind of go through some different areas of our life, some different topics. And yes, I got you. I heard you packing up that bulletin in that Bible. I hit that last point. You're like, okay, we're going to wrap up. Uh Uh-uh. We're not done yet. Matthew 6, starting in verse 25, he says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on is life not more than food and the body more than clothing. It's as if Jesus was standing here today speaking to us. In a world where last year 42% of Americans said that they struggle with anxiety, Jesus says, don't be anxious. If you ever wonder what's the significance of scripture, is it really relatable and applicable to my life? Yes, it is. He continues, Jesus said, look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? There's a haunting question for us as we seek to let go of control in our life. Verse 28, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, the richest man in Scripture, in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Jesus is saying, hey, recognize that, that your heavenly Father loves you. He sees your needs, and he can provide, because look at how he provides for the world around you. And then he closes with this statement. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Maybe to live the good life that we're looking for, to experience the satisfaction that we crave, we need to let go of the desire to find our satisfaction in our money, our fame, our success, our achievements, our appearance, our affirmation, whatever it is in this world, and instead, pause and turn and pursue God. As Jesus says here, seek the kingdom and his righteousness, because again, Jesus' key to the good life is to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And when we do that, we will be satisfied. So today, let me ask you, what are you craving? What is not the craving for your next meal, but the craving of your heart? What is the the longing and desire of your life? Is it for the things of this world? Is it for money? Is it for success? Is it for affirmation and, and connection? Is it for stuff? Or is it for a deeper connection to God? Is it for living more connected to your Savior, being more obedient to Him, experiencing His goodness in your life? Because those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. Our prayer for you is that you would hunger and thirst for God and His righteousness in your life and that you would find the most incredible joy and satisfaction in doing that. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for the teachings of Jesus. I thank you for the Bible that speaks to our world today. As we are anxious about our futures, we're anxious about our present, as we wrestle with motivations and cravings in our life that don't always align with you, God, we just want to pause and say, God, help us to hunger and thirst for you. Help us to desire to be more obedient to you, to be more connected to you, to be more faithful in our walk with your son, Jesus. Because we know that the things of this world don't satisfy. But you promise here that when we seek after you and crave you, we will be satisfied. So help us to do that. Help us to trust you when the temptation to veer off course with junk food and distractions come. And help us to be faithful each and every day to follow and serve you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.